Hello, everyone. Welcome to our binary episode this week. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. As always, we'll cover the Spot the Vuln challenge solution uh, for the challenge that we had up yesterday, and then we'll get into some of our topics. So, Z, uh, take it away. Yeah, so this week's Spot the Vuln did come from a Discord user, or at least based on a challenge that was actually sent out initially on Discord. Um and not quite created by me. I did have a back and forth where I fixed a number of issues, and this was kind of the final form of it. Um, that said, the issue is, well, one is a binary search. This just doesn't work. Um, so there is kind of the logical bug with the fact that um, uh, on line 8, UN32T uh, middle does the calculation by doing end minus star divided by 2. Um, what you'd probably want there, if you're trying to calculate the middle, is start plus end or end plus start divided by two. You know, averages them out, truncates it, and gets the actual middle point. If you're not too familiar with how binary search works, you can give that to Google. Very common algorithm. Um, it, you know, classic example of like divide and conquer. So it calculates that middle. Uh, in this case, incorrectly, so you can get a denial of service. Uh, having it. Uh, basically end up in an infinite loop if it falls into the right sort of case. Um, or the problem that I was kind of going for and looking for as a solution to this one and kind of the intended solution was the fact that when middle is zero and that first value in the array, so it's going to do the access to whatever the uh calculate value for middle is it's going to do that access on line nine and compare it against a in theory user provided value oh um, and when that value is great when the value at the first index of a is greater than the search value it's going to fall into that else statement starting on line 13 actually recursively calling binary search on line 14 and there it does middle minus one uh which if middle is zero, will end up being a very large number as the integer underflows wraps back around, uh, giving you a binary search where it's then going to do a middle calculation. Um, well, one thing it's still inside the array, middle calculation being done, being way out of bounds, giving you kind of that axis there, and it's going to make a variety of axes depending on what the memory is there, but you can derive some information out of or potentially search for a particular value in memory based off of that. So it gives you a fairly large out of bouncing. I would say one thing to kind of look at fixing on this one is to consider using signed values. Sim that way the end greater than star would have caught this one. Um, obviously having the correct uh, middle value calculation would have been a big help, but there are other ways that can go wrong too. Um, so, I mean, there's kind of, obviously, fixing the middle is, I think, the big thing to do. But in terms of preventing the bug, I would lean, in general, towards using signed values uh, myself. Because most things, like, if it's big enough that it's going to actually, if you're going to support the inputs, like, get big enough to support, uh, like, the full scope of a 32-bit unsigned, or go beyond the scope of a signed integer value, you should probably extend the space out. So using a, you know, long, long or something rather than, or using a, in this case, a 64 bit integer rather than 32, not extending the space by that little bit uh, that you get by extending it uh, with just the sign. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, you do get a, more than a little bit. Like, you are, like, doubling your space. But, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, you extend are, the but data it's... type. Don't hack it with the signness, yeah. Yeah, but especially with 32-bit, though, you kind of end off where you're not changing the order of magnitude at all. Um, just by adding that bit, you're still, like, what does that change? That changes you, like, a few extra billion. Uh, yeah. If you're still, if you're having inputs that are in the hitting that billion value and trying to support that, it makes sense, I think, to extend out rather than just adding, like, a few more billion. Like, it feels kind of band-aid. And that way you can catch an issue like this where you're expecting it to go 
or at least be less than the start, where start would be zero. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of a complex issue because you have to look at the calculations and, and the uh, control flow of what's going on there. It's probably one of the more complex uh, spot the bone challenges that we've had, so... Um, yeah, it's a fun one, though, because of the calculations. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things you know you know it's going to be wrong, so it's maybe easier to spot on this one. Um, you know, just looking for a place something could go wrong, and really the only thing you can look at is that middle access, at <clears> least <throat> in terms of an exploitable sort of issue. Info disclosure, I guess, here, but still. Yeah. So, you know, I'll preface this by saying this is probably the most complex vulnerability in the episode. <laughs> the rest of the vulnerabilities we have are uh, shockingly simple. In fact, the entire premise of the next post, which is from Project Zero, is about that fact. So, um, Project Zero, uh, this was a report put out by Tavis Ormandy, and it was a vulnerability in Mozilla's Network Security Services Library, which is used for cryptography. And uh, the bug here, like I said, it's pretty easy as far as Project Zero posts go, um, which is like the, the point of the post. Um, the bug is when parsing and storing an RSA 2048 signature into the VFY context structure. Um, obviously, the buffer for that signature is of a fixed size, um, but they don't actually do any size checking on the input signature. So if you just provide a really large signature, you can cause memory corruption. And uh, it's really weird because like, this is a blatant somewhat blatant bug, right? It's taking input data, it's putting it into a buffer, and it's not doing any size checking on that payload. Um, and the post explicitly says, like, this wasn't a process failure. Like, Mozilla is not some, like, you know, indie company that doesn't know how to do security, right? They have bounty programs, they have security teams, they have fuzzing setups and automated testing, uh, and they even had coverage in the vulnerable areas. So it was a bit of a shock for this vulnerability to be found in this area. Um, and it also wasn't a bug that was introduced in some recent commit or something. Um, according to the post, it's been there since a refactor in 2012, and it was then duplicated again in 2017 um, with RSA PSS support. So it's not like it was just introduced like a couple months ago, and it took, you know, a couple months to find. It's been in there for years. Um, yeah, so I this mean, blog post is dedicated to understanding why. Yeah, it checks um, all the boxes for something that really should have been caught earlier. Um, as you're saying, like, Mozilla is... I mean, I know uh, at least a lot of us are going to be thinking about Mozilla and Firefox and security-wise, I mean, Chrome is generally viewed as the stronger browser, but it's not that Mozilla is just slacking on a lot of that or don't have a good process. I just kind of want to call that out, like... This was something that could have been caught by fuzzing, for sure. And had fuzzers capable of hitting this code, had things hitting it, it's not a complex area. It's not like, um, as they talk about in here, it's not something like ASAN wouldn't have been able to, to detect uh, address sanitizer, if you're not familiar. Uh, you know, it definitely could have been hit here. Um, and I, like Spectre was just saying, a lot of this post goes into why that's the case, which... Is perhaps a bit of an interesting discussion. Yeah, so the stars kind of had to align um, for this issue to have not been caught. So it's it's pretty interesting when you go through um, the reasonings that Project Zero has or the speculations they have as to why it kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, so it starts off like Tavis initially starts off with saying that they caught this bug when they were experimenting with different introspection methods for fuzzing. Um, so looking for alternatives to like the common metric of code coverage. So a lot of fuzzers out there for years now have just been looking at, you know, what code do I cover? How much of the file do I cover? Um, and using that as the base metric. Um, but Tavis was experimenting with like, what about stack coverage? Um, basically monitoring the stack, the call stack, um, as well as like object isolation, which is the idea of using pieces of a file format, like headers or chunks or whatever, and extracting the ones out that cause new stack traces to be found, and then combining them with other fuzz data. So he was kind of experimenting a bit with um, exploring new directions with fuzzers. Yeah, and I guess I'll clarify. That was what led to the bug. I'll clarify slightly on there and also mention that the stack coverage, like it's still code coverage. It's just um, the usual way of kind of detecting how far you've gone in code is purely by looking at the basic blocks that are covered. 
um, versus looking at the coverage through the stack. So a different stack trace um, wouldn't be considered or would be considered potential or could be considered new coverage. Whereas um, in the case of just looking at the basic blocks, uh, you might have a function that calls like gets coverage on the same basic blocks, but calls it in a different way and it can get pruned out a lot easier. Um, so it's it's a different metric for code coverage, but in terms of determining what's new coverage or not, if that makes sense or makes it a little bit more clear what was going on here. That was a good way of putting it, I think. Uh, it's basically adding nuance to like what's going on in the test case. So um, yeah, that's when he was experimenting with that, um, they stumbled into this bug. Uh, when going into the issues of why this might not have been caught earlier by Mozilla, uh, the first issue mentioned is uh, missing end-to-end -end testing. So basically what he's saying there was they were fuzzing components in kind of a modular fashion, and they even reached like some of the vulnerable code there. But since the signature was never actually verified or used, um, which I'll get into in a little bit, um, it just couldn't really be detected. Um, another thing is they had an arbitrary limit on the size of fuzzing inputs. Uh, they're limited to 10,000 bytes, whereas NSS doesn't actually do any hard limiting. Um, so that could have resulted in edge cases not really being tested well. Um, and then the third and most interesting one, in my opinion, is uh, critiquing of the coverage metric as a whole, um, stating that the uh, fuzzers here, uh, they use the combined coverage metrics by OSS fuzz instead of individual coverage, which was misleading because the vulnerable code was getting hit, but not by the correct fuzzers. Um, it was getting hit by the fuzzers um, that was targeting code kind of later on in the execution process. Um, so it was using like default hard-coded certificates, whereas this bug is in the parsing of the certificates. So yeah, yeah the so... code was getting covered, but it wasn't getting covered by like anything that would be targeting that area with actually dangerous input. Yeah, I would actually jump back and say that issue one, like the first one missing end-to-end -end testing is kind of the more interesting point, at least my opinion there. And I think you're actually kind of hitting on something that comes down to that end to end. Now, he calls it out there as just being like the metrics are misleading and the true by presenting them as um, kind of unifying all of this coverage. It doesn't really capture the fact that there's no int or there's no integration testing, which is kind of why I want to point out on missing end to end testing. In the development world, we'll sometimes talk about unit testing, where you take a small unit of code and you run a bunch of test cases against and you test all of the units of your code. And that's important to do. It's part of testing. But another part of the testing is your integration testing. And I meant to grab the image of this meme, but there's a picture of, might even have been a GIF, that I've seen floating around, probably on like Reddit or something, but where what would happen is it's like a video in a bathroom where there's a one of those hand dryers that works automatically and just detects motion and starts blowing. And it's placed right above a trash can where people were throwing out if they were to manually dry their hands and use um, just paper towel. And of course that thing goes off. It starts blowing hot air into the trash can, which then blows the papers back up which then triggers the whole thing on against you know everything works the trash can works the hand dryer works but nobody tested the integration of them um and it's important to have that full end-to-end -end testing or integration testing um would at least be the term i'm more familiar with it it's important to kind of have that there in the fuzzing because there are issues that exist on those boundaries where all the components work, but not when you actually put them together, or at least not how you would expect them to work. Yeah, so I can see why you find that the most interesting issue. Um, it definitely makes sense, and it, it can be hard to test things end-to-end. -end. Like, I can definitely see why a developer might be like, well, that's going to be a lot of effort to, like, test that and whatever and let's just test the individual components is easier yeah or at least um, the most important one here i mean the misleading metrics is definitely interesting to call that out um it's not something i've really thought about before 
um, on, in terms of how you're even presenting the metrics and showing like, hey, this is being covered. Like, sure, they're getting coverage of this because they're fuzzing this area, but they're not getting coverage of all these other things because that's something else. So, yeah, I found issue three most interesting for two reasons. Um, one was kind of like you said, it wasn't really something I had thought about much before. But the other reason is, too, it is kind of a good argument as to why coverage like we've we've kind of had this discussion before a little bit when talking about fuzzing. And um, I think there's a common sentiment that there's too much emphasis placed on coverage or too much uh, faith put in it, I guess. And this is like a good example of that where like just raw coverage on its own without considering the context doesn't mean anything. Um, and it's it's almost more dangerous if you take the coverage at face value and make decisions based on it without looking into the nuances. Like it's it's almost worse than not having any coverage at all um, because it, it kind of makes you make these assumptions that you, you know, run away with. Um, so, well, but and I have down... seen some. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I have seen some arguments as well. I think there's actually a paper um, that I saw mentioned on Twitter that is trying to argue against like the this perception that coverage is everything. Um, so that that's kind of why I found that interesting. But yeah, go ahead, Z. Yeah, well, we've talked before, as you were alluding to, about coverage as like, it's not a great metric like there are problems by just looking at code coverage and just looking at the basic blocks that are getting hit at the same time it's i don't see a lot of suggestions on something that's practical and effective that actually works as well in its place like it's one of those things that's just been stupidly effective um it just it keeps working and we do find bugs as we keep fuzzing deeper and getting more coverage um what are mandy does suggest here when it comes to the uh using stack traces actually i think there's been a bit of recent kernel work on uh or not kernel work on a kernel fuzzer that kind of does some deduplication on the same basis i feel like we talked about a paper or maybe i just read a paper recently that was kind of about that i think we did cover it actually um I forget the name of the paper, unfortunately, but I do remember like the crash deduplication um, being talked about. Although in that Igor. case, I think it was. Yeah, Igor. Yeah, yeah. Igor was the paper. Um, yeah, they were talking about doing like hashes of the stack traces, which they said weren't. I think they came up with like a better solution than that. But that was one of the things mentioned as like uh, one of the methods used by like other setups to try to deduplicate crashes. But um. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not trying to say like coverage as a metric is terrible and you should never use it. Um, mainly what I was just trying to say there was that you have to look at more of what's going on than just the coverage. And this is a good example of that. Uh, I think it's easy to just look at the coverage number or look at like a file and see like, oh, I've got 60% coverage here. That's good. Like it's easy to just look at that and then move on. Right. Um, and this is a good example of why you can't really do that, especially in like a really complex fuzzing setup like this one. Yeah, I mean, so it depends. In this case, like, they're running with a lot of modular fuzzers. Oh. So seeing that coverage, you know it's not being hit, or you don't necessarily know it, kind of what's being hit. It's the fact that it's being hit in this very unit-specific way. Oh. Whereas if you're, say, only running, like, you're running your own fuzzing campaign, you're only running, like, one fuzzer on this area. You're not really running into that same trap of missing information because of you know, having been unit testing because it's not so modular. So, like, I, I agree with you in this case that matters, but at the same time, if you're just running your own campaign, you're running the one fuzzer, coverage is still kind of the point there, and more are still, um, it, it's there's no different metric to look at, basically. Like, I agree with the idea of, um... I, I guess uh, I've been... Ra I'm rambling a little bit, but, uh... I don't think it's misleading unless you're actually running, like, these multiple fuzzers that are very targeted. Um, otherwise, it's just... That's the result. 
So I am going to disagree a little bit there. Um, my reasoning for that is, like, in this specific case, yes, you're right. This was because they had different modules targeting different things. But ultimately, what it comes down to, like, why the other fuzzer didn't catch this issue that was covering this code is because um, it was covering this code with safe information, right? It was taking a safe known certificate that worked in order to target better attack surface. And there's other cases that are like that. Like there is, it is really tricky when you're fuzzing. Like if you want to fuzz deeper code, then you have to have correct inputs. But if you're passing intentionally correct inputs, then you're not going to be testing that code that is parsing those inputs. So it, it is kind of this tricky problem, and I have seen it in other areas as well. Um, like you were talking about kernel earlier, let's take kernel, for example. If you're targeting an interface where you need to be able to open um, some valid handle, and that requires passing valid uh, input data, it's easy to see the code coverage for that, where you're just setting up using known valid data and thinking that you're fuzzing that code, but you're not actually fuzzing that code. You're getting coverage in it, but you're not fuzzing it. You're not testing it. So that's kind of what I was trying to get at a little bit with like putting too much faith in the coverage metric is you have to look at what's like the raw coverage doesn't tell you much. You have to look at what's actually being tested and covered, not just what's being covered. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, but again, that still feels like it's coming back to issue one the whole integration testing and testing everything to some degree um but i because i mean he's only raising it here as misleading metrics um and in that case it's just like you need to look at more versus or need to consider other things rather than being misled by anything but i don't know i mean that i don't disagree with you if anything we're probably just kind of using we're describing the same thing, I think. Or we at least agree, maybe some difference in terminology. I don't think it's worth much further discussion, at least. Yeah, so I was going a little bit beyond like what was written in the Project Zero post, to be clear. like I wasn't saying that's what they were saying, but um, I just kind of wanted to use it as a bit, bit of a launching point, I guess, to talk yeah, about fair. that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a good point to call out. Like You need to pay attention to not just the coverage. I mean, coverage is... A easy metric um and you know as traditionally bugs fall out as you get more coverage it's a true statement but there are still other things you can do besides just coverage as you're kind of getting at yeah all right so up next we have bugs in mediatek's audio digital signal processor firmware which is a cool target to look at because it actually runs a custom architecture and has some uh, anti-RE measures like anti-copying and whatever. Um, so the security research is a little bit like you're researching into a bit of a hostile environment here. Um, on top of that, some of these vulnerabilities can be reached from Android user space. So the impact is high there too. Uh, the first half of this blog post is dedicated to reverse engineering of the firmware. Um, and they did that a few different ways. Uh, first, they looked at the audio IPI driver that's used to bridge the gap from user space uh, to the audio DSP. Um, and that's done through the system control processor. IPI, um, if I remember correctly, stands for like inner processor uh, interrupts. So if you were curious what that was, what that stood for in the driver name. Um, and the other thing they did was they also dumped the audio DSP partition from a rooted device. Uh, and then they managed to uh, reverse that by throwing the partition dump into IDA. Um, it, it wasn't super easy to do that, though, because even though IDA technically has support for the Extensa architecture, um, which is the architecture the firmware runs on, it's very limited, and there is a lot of opcodes that IDA doesn't have support for. Um, plus, this ISA has variable opcode sizes, like x86, so they had to figure out where functions begin to get any useful disassembly. Um, what they did there was they used the Extensa SDK to use their objump, object dump tool, um, which supported more instructions. And then they wrote an IDA script that would use that information to do automated disassembly using the basic Extensa instructions. They were still missing some because MediaTek added their own like proprietary instructions on top of that. Um, but it they didn't really go into detail on that. It wasn't like super relevant here. Um, what they discovered was that the DSP firmware was running a customized version of free RTOS um, for the operating system. 
and they found a bunch of tasks for things like phone calls, audio playback, um, etc. And all of these like threads, uh, for lack of a better word, can receive these IPI messages. Um, they found three vulnerabilities in the different message handlers for those tasks. Uh, the first being a heap overflow in the audio DSP task uh, message A2D shared memory handler, um, where it would take a param1 parameter and use it for a mem copy um, to this A2D share destination, but they didn't do any checking on that param1 parameter. They just pass it directly into mem copy, which, you know, it's it's a bit of a meme bug. Um, the second bug is also a meme bug. It's basically the same issue in the init share mem core function, uh, which is called when an IPA IPI message with the ID of seven is passed through. Um, it seems they didn't really manage to get reversing far enough to figure out what exactly that message was for. But if you pass an IPI message with ID of seven, um, again, param one is used as a size for a copy. Um, this time they kind of sort of tried to check it. Um, they do a check against the size against like hex E zero bytes. But the problem is the destination for that copy is only a 20 or a hex 20 byte buffer. So it's still a fail because you can still overflow by hex C zero bytes. This one's really strange. Um, it's weird to have like a sanitization check here, but for it to be like wrong, it's just yeah, I mean, kind of strange. This kind of just screams the whole idea of um, using basically. Okay, it can it can be a couple of things. Um, my main thought is just they were using hard coded values. So when they ended up changing, like, oh, we actually don't need this much space, they changed the size of the object down to the 20, but they didn't change the check. Uh, so just having them separate, uh, whereas they should have been using like a define, uh, using a constant, using something so that they could change it one place and always be comparing with the same value. Just not doing that. The other possibility is copy and paste. Uh, some other bit of code, they just copied it out, changed that, you know, changed one value but not the other. Um, kind of leans in both directions. I'd probably lean towards saying it's a case of uh, just using, using the same value and not updating. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's the same deal. You have these two values. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's one of those cases, if you pretty... used a const, you'd have been better off, or use the yeah. defined. I, I think that's a pretty reasonable uh, guess. Um, obviously, I mean, I've we don't done know, that, but we're speculating. So. Yeah. Um, there was uh, one other bug. Uh, there was also an out-of-bounds write in the audio DSP task PCM prepare message handler. Um, it would call, this call would use a user-provided index to index into an audio buffer array, and it would do so without checking that index at all. Um, it also doesn't verify that the source address provided is actually valid, which could be a DOS, but that's not nearly as interesting, obviously. Um, the un or the uh, unmitigated index being passed in is a lot more impactful there uh, and can, can lead to a relative out-of-bounds write. Um, they then go on to detail how these bugs could potentially be hit. Because while it can be hit using that audio IPI driver I mentioned earlier, that driver isn't directly accessible to unprivileged applications. Uh, it's sandboxed off through SE Linux. Um, the only contexts that have access to that driver are the factory, uh, meta test, and MTK HAL audio contexts, which you would need, you basically need access to the hardware abstraction layer or HAL library for audio um, in order to access that driver. Um, they do mention kind of this other issue, though, which I think was like the primary patch point, which was the fact that um, it was possible for the audio manager to set uh, MediaTek parameters that get passed to the driver. Um, so by getting your malicious app to bind to the audio service and use the set methods, um, the set methods method on it, um, that can be used to change the config um, via the param file. And that opens up a lot more attack service for you to be able to attack that HAL library, um, which would give you the foothold you would need to exploit the previous bugs. Um, yeah, I believe I, that's uh, the set parameters, not set method. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, set, yeah, I got them mixed yeah, up in it, my notes. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it doesn't really make much of a difference as to what's going on here. MediaTek has, you know, the few proprietary parameters that you can actually set. One being, as you were just saying, the... Uh, or I guess you were probably just about to get onto the parameter file which you can set um and i guess i'll 
carry on with the explanation on that last one. Uh, the parameter file, uh, usually this is something that users can change or can't change too easily. You know, a privileged user may be able to, but generally speaking, it's going to be trusted. So in theory, other like the actual device manufacturer could uh, just assume that that's going to be a safe file that's either provided by them, it's trusted. Um, so they won't do as much checking on it to validate it. And that's what they found. They don't detail the actual uh, privilege escalation they had here, but they did mention that the uh, libfvaudio.so from, um, I think it was a Yaomi device. I don't see it here, but um, was vulnerable to uh, basically a malicious pram file, largely because they probably weren't expecting the parameter file to actually be something malicious in the first place. Um, whereas MediaTek, by giving users access to actually change this file, uh, an attacker could cause a parser issue, end up breaking a uh, breaking into that device or breaking into that library, which they could then use to attack the DSP directly or hit that driver directly. Um, in any case, sects like these, you would need to get into either the service or library, something like that first. But it's a viable attack route. I, we, I don't think we've seen a lot of cases going through like the services or something like this first. But I do think that will become more common as Android, like the kernel core, continues to be hardened. Then you're going to want to target certain things. I guess we have seen a handful of them, so it's not like this never happens. But actually, I think we even covered a paper about a fuzzer specifically looked for those sorts of issues. So, yeah, I mean, it's there. It's just not the most popular route right now, at least that I hear about. Uh, but it is kind of fun where the... Uh, SOC provider here is creating the issue that are violating the assumptions that the device manufacturers had. Yeah, so what I like about this post is Android is a very hardened target. Um, most of the, like, I guess, low hanging fruit attack surface, as you could call it, has been picked. Uh, it's been hardened over time. It's going to be very hard to, to hit in you know 2021 and going forward but the firmware like media tech still is a pretty soft target like this code is very these are low-hanging fruit bugs um there i i very much doubt that these have been like this code has been fuzzed or tested in any way because these would be found with a fuzzer probably like instantly um so this post kind of delves into that idea of like going after the software attack surface and yes it, it does take more steps to get there it's it's not as straightforward to hit from like an unprivileged context, but um, it shows that it is possible to do it. And, you know, it kind of highlights that there's still places you can look for bugs, even in really hardened targets. So, yeah, I mean, this is also a little bit less valuable than, say, something in the kernel core, simply because, um, you know, in their case, it's a Yaomi specific thing. Like, yes, the uh, bugs in MediaTek, which is, uh, Relatively common. I mean, MediaTek's one of the big players for that. Despite that fact, um, you know, they could only exploit this by having an issue that's device specific. Um, you might be yeah. able to find some that's a little bit more general, but you're still very limited. One by MediaTek itself, only devices that do MediaTek are using the chip. And then two, whatever your foothold is, is probably going to limit you more so. That's probably a big part of why we don't hear about this sort of route more often, it's just because it is a bit more limited. Oh, uh, but yeah, I mean, Android has been taking a lot of very good steps towards that attack service reduction. And so, I mean, that very well may start pushing more exploits in this direction. For sure. I think it's pretty much a guarantee at this point. Um, but yeah, like a really good write up. Um, it was like a bit long, but they're talking about multiple issues and there's a lot of background information on the reverse engineering, which I did appreciate. Um, I do like looking at that, especially like when you're talking about Android and some of these more proprietary uh, firmwares and partitions, it is a bit of a mystery. Um, so it's, it's cool to see 
post like the post also tackles that angle of it too they didn't yeah, just I skip mean, over that's, that that's kind of classic with checkpoint research they tend to include a lot of that background there yeah they're always fairly well written it feels like we haven't covered anything from checkpoint in quite a while i've actually missed it, it's covering been a while uh, they haven't put out anything like this in what feels like a good while. It's just been their usual uh, threat posts. Yeah, yeah. so it was cool to be able to cover them again. All right, so we'll get into our last topic here, which is a write-up on exploiting a Linux kernel vuln we've talked about before. Um, we talked about this vuln on November 9th, I believe, on our binary episode. Yes, the um, episode this was... came out on the 10th. Yeah. Um, so this was the TIPC vulnerability that was a heap overflow due to the key length from uh, packet being used for a memcopy before it was actually validated. Um, that post, though, at the time, just talked about the the vulnerability and the fix. It didn't really go into any exploitation details. Uh, I think we might have speculated a bit on what you could do on the podcast, but we didn't have anything like concrete. We didn't really try to do it ourselves. Um, but this post from Haxon goes into how they exploited the bug. Uh, while also bypassing common modern mitigations like um, supervisor mode access prevention, uh, supervisor mode execution prevention, ASLR, and page table isolation. Uh, the foundation for the exploit chain here is the use of the uh, message message object, with, which is an elastic object. I think we talked about a paper that went into detail on elastic objects in the Linux kernel before. Yeah. Um, though um... I don't remember when that was. Uh, that was episode 41, might have been 51, I should have taken note of that, it was 51 or 41, and yeah, we he actually even calls out the paper in this, in this write-up, um, yeah, he says, when googling I stumbled across this cool paper from Penn State that, uh, covers it, and yeah, that same paper that we covered, um, like I said, episode, I'm pretty sure it was episode 41, of. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, can do a I thing. can do a quick grep just to see if I can um just make sure on that. Uh the, what was the name of the paper again? Sorry. I just saw it brought up. Well but... Okay, there it is. Um uh, so uh, that I'm was sorry, episode, episode fifty three. Yeah. I... A, a systematic study of elastic object and kernel exploitation. Yeah. You were close on the Well, I had it completely wrong. I should have uh, saved it, but yeah, 53. We covered it. It was the last topic. Yeah. So um, basically, if you're not familiar with like the concept of an elastic object, though, um, basically, it's an object that could be arbitrarily or somewhat arbitrarily sized. So basically, any object that consists of like a header followed by a payload that like an auxiliary data buffer or something. Um, it's a common pattern. Like we've talked about things like this before, um, where you have yeah. an array at the end of it, the data array at the end and your structure just ends with that pointer, that array. Um, and then you have a size somewhere in there. And that way, when they copy the data in, they just copy it all in there with this variable size um, and know what the actual size is ending with the pointer. You've probably seen it. If you've done uh, C programming, it's, it's a common thing to use, or it's a common yeah. technique. So any structure that follows that uh, format or concept, it fits the bill here for being an elastic object. Um, that object was useful for deriving an info leak. The other object that was used here was the TTY struct. Um, that one isn't elastic, but it is very useful and contains things like a TTY ops pointer to a function table of pointers or various operations like ioctal, read, write, and things like that. Um, it's a very juicy target for control flow hijacking because it's pretty easy to do if you can corrupt a TTY object. Um, it also has the added benefit of the first field being a magic int. Um, so if you're doing like if you're trying to leak the object and you want to verify that that is the like that the object you're leaking is a TTY, you can compare the first four bytes or whatever um, to make sure it matches up with the magic that's assigned to a TTY object. Um, so by chaining the two, driving an info leak with an overflow into message message, um, which they do by corrupting the size there um, and leaking the TTY contents, and then driving the control flow hijack through the TTY object. You can somewhat easily get code execution because then it's just a matter of defeating uh, KSLR with your leak. Um, getting you can also uh, leak the pointer to control data that you have in the kernel heap, which kind of circumvents uh, SMAP because you can fake your object in kernel space. Um, and what I'm talking about there is the the operations table. 
um, you need to have a pointer to that to place it in the TTY that you corrupt. So yeah, you get your fake operations table in there, you leak your pointer to that data, um, you then use the overflow again to smash the TTY, um, place your custom operations table in there, and then control flow hijack. Uh, it's basically just a matter of calling an operation on that corrupted uh, TTY device. Um, so yeah, like SMAP and SMAP aren't really concerns there, which is nice. Um, from there, they went with the increasingly popular route of abusing the mod probe path uh, variable in the kernel heap to get an arbitrary module loaded as root. Um, it's kind of funny. I don't remember seeing a lot of like exploits or exploit strategies using that technique until like this year. <laughs> this year, I feel like we've covered like four or five topics that have used it by now. Um, it is a very cool strategy. For those not aware, it's basically um, this mod probe path variable in the kernel is used to, um, you know, load a module in. And by just using an arbitrary write, uh, which has gotten through the code execution to smash that, you can get uh, privilege escalation pretty easily. You don't need to worry about escalating through like committing credentials, uh, committing root credentials or anything like that. Um, you just kind of smash this one kernel heap variable and you're good to go. Uh, it's one of the one of the increasing increasingly popular data only attacks. So yeah, I mean yeah, pretty nice mean, and smooth as far as exploits go. Like I said, it's data only, although because you're calling that out, I will mention that even though that aspect's data only, this does um at least in the way that he goes about this, um, it does still violate CFI. So you could, this isn't a completely like a CFI bypass. Um, CF, uh, because when he does the arbitrary write to actually uh, take control of the mod pro path, uh, that is done using just a partial gadget kind of in the middle of some function here. He just finds it. Your standard-ish sort of ROP gadget, you know, ends with the return um, as the call. You could probably find another gadget to use here, like if you were going to deal with CFI. Um, so he's corrupting the IOCTL as part of, or the operations, in the operation structure, the IOCTL pointer. So the IOCTL function, very easy to trigger, so he's not quite setting up a full ROP chain in this case. But he is pointing that just to what's effectively a ROP gadget that gives the arbitrary right. Um, if you want to tackle, tackle CFI also, which is the case with Android, there is KCFI, or CFI in the kernel. Um, you'd have to do a little bit more work on this, but I think that is why uh, Mod Pro Path is being a little bit more popular, is because it is kind of that data only, you don't need to, I mean, I guess, Calling the commit creds and stuff, um, they are full functions that you can use there, so it's not too bad when it comes to CFI. It, it's nice to see a bit of an alternate route. I will say, for more details on any of these, one, this is a well-done post, so, you know, give that a read. Uh, but we've kind of glossed over some details. Like, none of these are really new techniques. They're just putting it together, well-done post, and it's a bug. And the source bug is something we've talked about before. Uh, like targeting TTY structure, message, message. Both of those are common primitives to be using, so. Yeah, they even call out at the beginning of their write-up, like, um, if you're looking for anything novel here, then you're not going to find that. Um, yeah, but it's a well-done post, nonetheless. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it was very well-written. Uh, I did want to call that out. Um, yeah, it would be kind of interesting if somebody, like, took this exploit and modified it to avoid like using a code execution gadget to do the arbitrary write. Um, I don't know if you could still do it with a TTY, that might be tricky, but if you try to target a different object to get an arbitrary write primitive, um, like just to circumvent even a theoretical like CFI, um, that would be a cool thing to do as well. Like yeah, a cool I mean, exercise you can... to do. So when it comes at least to CFI Android kernel, like it's not fine grained. Um, like, no, because it's using like LVM's uh, CFI implementation. I mean, well, I guess you do have the option for memory tagging now. Not quite an Android. I guess that landed Linux 5.13. I'm sure... No, it did land Android 2, actually, so 5.10. I think. Uh, I, don't, I haven't seen a lot of devices yet that support memory tagging. But, it's um, very new. Yeah. yeah, but what I was going to get at there is... You, know, you still can use the control flow hijacking primitive 
it's just your targets are more limited. Like dealing with CFI, um, or at least these uh, coarse grained CFI options, effectively you're just limited instead of being able to call any arbitrary gadget like you've got with this, where it's just re calling somewhere that has a ret. So, like your standard ROP gadget, instead of that, um, what you do is you'd call function. So, you have to use the entire function as your block. Um, so it's not like you can't hijack control flow, it's just you can't, it reduces the gadgets that you get. Uh, in a lot of large applications, you're going to have a fair number of functions that still do some interesting things. Uh, it just limits where you can go with memory tagging, that's going to limit it quite a bit more also. Uh, so I mean, I'd be interested in somebody doing that. I just want to show like you could still use the control flow hijack here. It's not like control flow hijacking is dead with CFI. It's just a little bit different because of CFI, at least how CFI is commonly implemented. Now, there was even some talk about doing fine grained CFI into the Linux kernel. I don't think that ever landed, but I know it was researched at one point. Uh, where you're talking about CFI here, and sorry, we have been saying CFI a lot. Um, I do want to mention, like, the, the the most common trick for abusing code execution to do something useful on with the Linux kernel is to call the uh, um, commit creds and then prepare init cred, because um, the init cred is a root credential, and then you commit that to your process. Um, with CFI, it would be a little bit difficult to do that still, because you're not just doing one call, you're doing two. Um, you do need a valid like credential structure pointer to pass to commit cred. Um, so if CFI is in play, that would be a bit tricky to do. You could probably still do it if, if you get like creative enough. Um, but that is where something like just going with an arbitrary write primitive instead would maybe be more valuable or um, easier in a way. So... Yeah, yeah I mean, it I just would be cool to see like, somebody uh, to do, like, that would be a fun exercise for somebody to do if they're bored or something, um, would be to convert this, instead of doing a control flow hijack, um, getting an arbitrary write primitive and using that to achieve the same goal, basically, of attacking mod pro path. Yeah, and, and I agree, like, um, going the commit creds route isn't as straightforward as just the two functions, but... um. Like your your CFI impact there is also slightly limited because of the fact that they are like you do have those functions, but it is like I said nested in there that does create a little bit of a complication. Yeah. All right. Um. But yeah, with that said, that's basically all the topics that we have for this week. Um. Unless you have anything that you want to add onto the tail end there, Z, we'll we'll go ahead and wrap it up. No. Nope. All right. Cool. So thank you to everyone who tuned in. The VOD will be up on Twitch immediately or on YouTube tomorrow. We also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links on Anchor. Uh, for alerts of when we're going live and to join the community, follow our Twitter and join our Discord. Links for those are in the chat or uh, down below um, for those of you watching afterwards. We'll be back next Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific for the Bounty episode, and next Tuesday for at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific for uh, binary stuff. And those will be our last episodes before our winter break until we return on January 10th and 11th. Um, and we will see you all next week.